come to this time of gathering and praise. Lord, we come with hope in our hearts and spirits to receive your gracious gift of love. Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ raised in power for us, Christ prays for us. My friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. <laughs>
gospel of feeding of the 5,000, but something weird to you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so more than 5,000 people were there with Jesus, and it was time to eat, and they did what? So let's read the feeding of the 5,000 from Matthew 14. Now, when Jesus heard this, he would 
withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds, when the, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. So, did you, by any chance, see the startling headline a while back that read, Arkansas woman texted father's number every day after he died. She got a response four years later. That made the, st that made the story below the headline sound like an outrage from the other side of the grave. But the actual story, the story was really much far less sensational. For four years, Chastity Patterson, then 23 of Newport, Arkansas, had been mourning the death of Jason Legions, who, while not her biological father, had been so much like a father to her that she called him death. After he died, Chastity continued to text his phone every day to update him about her life. While she didn't expect a response, the daily texting was a way of dealing with her grief. In her message on October 25, the night before the fourth anniversary of his death, she told about how she'd beaten cancer and hadn't gotten sick since his passing. She also wrote about falling in love and having her heart broken, joking that legions would have killed the guy. But then she received a response. It was not legions, but a man identified only as Brad, who had been receiving her daily messages these past four years. I am not your father, Brad texted, but I have been getting all your messages for the past four years. I lost my daughter in a car wreck in August 2014, and your messages have kept me alive, Brad said. When you text me, I know it's a message from God. Brad went on to say that he had read her messages for all that time, but hadn't texted her back for fear of breaking her heart. Chastity posted the exchange to Facebook saying, Today was my sign that everything is okay, and I can let him leave his rest. Her post was then shared more than 288,000 times and picked up by several media outlets. How Brad came to receive Chastity's messages is really easily explained. When an individual surrenders a phone number, whether because of relocation, death, or other reasons, the company that supplied the phone service eventually reissues it to a new customer, sometimes as soon as 30 days after the number was disconnected. After Chastity's story went viral, she posted that she had shared the story to show friends and family that there is a God, and it might take four years, but he shows up right on time. While Chastity's story was flashed out by several media outlets, few of the major national news organizations repeated the story at all, which suggests that by some standards, it didn't rise to the level of news, and there was no miracle involved. And that brings us to the scripture lesson for today. The well-known account of Jesus feeding more than 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish and ending up with 12 baskets of leftovers. This story appears in all four of our Gospels, a sure sign that the early Christians had no doubt that what Jesus had done that day was a miracle. 
But now fast forward to the 19th century when a Protestant Bible scholar named Heinrich Paulus examined the feeding of the 5,000 story. Paulus was a rationalist and as such was skeptical that miracles ever occur. He posited that what really happened was that in the spirit of the day, after Jesus blessed the meager amount of food on hand, the wealthier people in the crowd who had arrived with picnic baskets packed full shared their food with those who had none. I know, you, you want to kind of blow raspberries with that, don't you? Mm. People persuaded by Paulus say the real miracle was that the wealthy were inspired to share what they had. Paulus, by the way, is the same guy who proposed the swoon theory, which speculates that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but somehow survived his execution and proclaimed that he had risen from the dead. I am by no means telling you to believe what Paulus has to say, just sharing. So, of course, many of us have trouble reconciling miracles with reason or logic. And the, that logic gap is likely what the news writer was counting on when he headlined Christie's story to sound spectacular. But both the sensational headline and our natural skepticism miss the real story. That Chastity's text helped Brad deal with his grief following his daughter's death, and that his reply to chastity helped to put to rest her grief over Legion's death, and that both chastity and Brad viewed the texts from the other as conveying the message from God. Miracle stories like the feeding of the 5,000 and non-miracle stories like chastities invite us to think about how God does work in our lives. Certainly God is not limited to interventions that cannot be explained by science or that go beyond the realm of reasoning and logic. He can work through means we might label as coincidence or accident, or serendipity, or luck, or natural processes, or everyday happenings. In Isaiah, we find God saying, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, we preachers, we often quote these words to emphasize how God can work through means that we humans don't have available to us. And that is certainly a correct message to hear in these verses. But we shouldn't take them as if they are saying that God works only through extraordinary or miraculous means. God's higher ways may in some cases, operate through everyday things, through natural functions of life. Some Christians have observed that God uses means or agents or tools or intermediaries much more often than he intervenes through the laws of nature, with bright lights and all that, such as what happened with Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, this does not denigrate the majesty of God's ways. In fact, it might be said that in sending Jesus as a human being, God was putting his majesty in an ordinary container. Consider this true story from a book called Small Miracles. Carol Anderson was young, a young widow whose husband died at 35. Bob Edwards was a young widower whose wife had been killed in a car accident at 29. Both had happy marriages, both, but after several lonely years, the two surviving spouses met and got married. They got along well, except for one thing, their differing opinions about how to handle their history. Bob wanted to explore it, to share with Carol about his past. 
He wanted to, and he wanted to know all about Carol's first husband and tell her about his first wife. Carol, however, didn't want to talk about it at all. Nothing about her, their previous marriages. The pain from her loss was still too strong. Why raise ghosts, she would say. But Bob felt that good memories should be pre preserved, not obliterated. The issue, it hung between them for a really long time, with Carol's view prevailing to Bob's disappointment. But finally, after a few years, Carol felt secure enough to talk about the past and decided to show Bob some snapshots from her first marriage. Among those photos was a pic were pictures that Carol had of her first husband had taken in France on their honeymoon. Here we are at Lourdes, Carol said, pointing to a photo taken at the famous Hebrew shrine. You went to Lourdes? Bob said, mildly interested. So did we. Well, I guess half the world goes there, Carol said. It wasn't really a big deal. But then Bob asked to see the photo again. Who is that couple in the background? I have no idea, Carol said. Just a couple who walked by and were caught by the shutter. I can see why you asked, though. It does look as though they're standing behind us, almost as if they're posing. But that's just an illusion. Know where it's going? Mm -hmm. That couple, Bob said, is me and my first wife. The matter for us to affirm today is raised both by the miracle story in the scripture reading and by some natural occurrences that take on special meanings for us, and that we see the hand of God behind them. From the perspective of daily life, there's not much value in arguing over whether miracles occur or whether there are rational explanations for the events that bring us healing, bring us meaning, bring us hope, or lift us up. If we experience God as being in them, we are in touch with the miraculous. Let's say it like this. We encounter many serendipitous happenings in life for which there is no spiritual intervention overriding the laws of nature. But something occurs that is not ordinary, not usual, and not what one would normally expect to happen. Perhaps God did not provide an exception to Newton's laws of motion, but he may well have moved people to interact in ways that provided what was needed by someone in a particular situation. In the case of Chastity and Brad, the miracle may have been that God moved both of them toward the mutual support and benefit that occurred. And we can say this as well. Both Chastity and Brad were quick to see God's fingerprints in their exchange. Skeptics might disagree, but some things take the eyes of faith to discern. If you look, you will find God's fingerprints all over the place. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
gladness, we present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Freely we have received, freely we give. to give our thanks and praise. Almighty God, blessed are you, strong and faithful. All your works, the height and the depth, echo the silent music of your praise. In the beginning, your words summoned light, night withdrew and creation dawned. As ages passed unseen, waters gathered on the face of the earth and light appeared. When Times at last had ripened and the earth grown full in abundance, you created in your image man and woman, the stewards of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all the living might find the voice to sing your praise and to celebrate the creation you call good. So now, with the voices of heaven, we join in their unending. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Above all, we give you thanks, O Lord, for your the wonderful works of your hands. When sin had scarred the world, you entered into covenant renew the whole creation. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, as a father joyfully welcomes his own, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. Through countless generations, your people hunger for the bread of freedom. For them he raised up Jesus your son, the living bread, in whom ancient hungers are satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer, he offered life to sinners, though death would hunt him down. But with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. Gracious God, as we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we commemorate Jesus, your son. Death could not bind him, for you raised him up in the spirit of holiness and exalted him as Lord of creation. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ 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 is risen. Christ
has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We pour ourselves out, eternal God. Let your Holy Spirit move in power over us and over these earthly gifts of bread and wine, that they may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ, and that we may become one in him. May his coming in glory find us ever watchful in prayer, strong in truth and love, and faithful to the breaking of the bread. Knowing that where two or more of us are gathered, you are there among us and answer our prayers. We lift up to you, Marlene. We lift up to you, Judy, and ask for your healing presence. Lord, at last, all we ask that all people will be free, all divisions healed, and with your full creation, we will sing your praise through your Son, Jesus Christ. All honor glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his rest, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, shed in my blood, sealed for the forgiveness of sins. Whoever believes in me, whoever drinks of this, will have new life. For whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the risen Lord until he comes. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the bread, body of Amen. Yeah. 